thinking I was going to direct classics. I was very interested in Shakespeare and Greek tragedies. And I got to know Paula's work, and not just her work, I have to say, the community of people that she brought to Brown at that time was Mila, Mila Cruz, Ruth Margraf, right. um, yeah, Gina DiFrido. Right. And uh, she created this community that I was completely drawn into. And, um, and I left knowing I was going to commit my life to advocating for new work and directing new work. And so here I am, and thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being a constant inspiration. And my first job out of, uh, out of Brown was actually working at the Vineyard Theater, where I got to see how I learned to drive. And um, I've, I've just watched Paula's work over the years. And most recently, Indecent, which I have to say, everyone should see this play, because I know even though it closed last night in New York, I am certain that it's going to have a life across the country. <laughs> <laughs> is really what inspired you to write for theater, and really, why do you keep returning to theater as the, the medium in which you're writing? That's a fantastic first question. But, uh, first, I want to say thank you. Um, and I, I, that was overwhelming to hear. Um, but I want to thank you, Haley, and I want to thank you, Jeremy. Um, and I want to tell everybody in the audience here how incredibly important Minneapolis is to American theater. Um, this is my third or fourth trip through here, and every time I come here, I wish I could stay longer and longer and longer. Um, the number of artists who come through here and then their work goes out into the world. Um, just to sit at the table today with these writers at the things that they created, and how many hours did we have that you were writing? were astonishing um, and just I leave this place so much richer than when I came believing in the power of theater and knowing we have an incredible next decade ahead so I know it's sometimes hard because you live here um, <laughs> realize that those of us outside of Minneapolis are tracking what's coming from Minneapolis and who in the community here is in the world and um, I always, when, when people ask me, where can I go uh, to start my career, Minneapolis is on the top of the list, just for a wish fulfillment for me, <laughs> so that I can, I, can, I can vicariously live here. Um, so I just wanted to start with that, and thank you. This is, the Playwright Center is, is just a remarkable institution in the United States, um, nothing like it. Um, so what inspired me to become a playwright? I really, I am terrible at acting. <laughs> <laughs> I am so bad at acting, and this is a true story, and I often say this, but um, I realized that I was gay in high school, and uh, in college I was cast in this 1950s kind of wonderful melodrama about lesbianism called The Killing of Sister George. Mm -hmm. And so I was cast as uh, the butch Sister George, uh, and it developed a lifelong habit of smoking cigars from that day in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> During the post-play discussion, everyone in the audience said no one could believe that I was lesbian. <laughs> the light bulb went off and thought, this is it. <laughs> Go on stage, ever. And, and so then I started thinking, how, I mean, for those of us who are in love with theater, you know that there, it's, it is akin to falling in love. I had fallen in love when I was 15, thanks to a high school drama class. And once I walked into the room, it was really me thinking, how do I not leave this room? How can I get to stay in the room? For a long time, it was being a stagehand and sweeping. After I realized I sucked at acting and that wasn't going to be it, I tried to be a stage manager, which I quite loved. And I have to say, of all of the things in the theater, I think the stage managers are the most blessed of theater artists. <laughs> person who conducts the performance, who creates the community, right? 
who really is the midwife for new work, who is really there to support everyone else's artistic process more than anyone else. And I tried for several years to be a stage manager and realized you need nerves of steel mm -hmm. to be able to conduct every night when suddenly the electricity goes off, when suddenly someone doesn't make their entrance, when suddenly, and the way that I think professional stage managers manage to do that through a lifetime, I think these would be people who would be remarkable doing triage in ER. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be as high stakes, but it's the same kind of, of set of skills. I don't have that. Um, I really enjoy my hysteria. So <laughs> that was it. And there's a, one other thing which I think has become important for me as, as one of my missions in life, uh, which is in the 1970s, I remember writing uh, Oldest Profession and delivering it to uh, an actress in her 70s who kind of said in this lovely way, oh, a playwright test. <laughs> How very few of us as women were in the field in 1975. But I also recognized that it was very, very hard for me to say I am a writer as a woman of this earlier generation. Um, easy for me to say I'm t a teacher. Easy for me to say I'm a stage manager but not easy to own up to being an artist. And mm -hmm. I do think that, that uh, it's an interesting point in time where we might be right now in the culture in terms of um, ego and women. And I feel that I've been watching now extraordinary mentoring and mothering going on so that daughters are enabled to have an ego that the mothers and grandmothers may not have had. And although I have not had children, I'm very much now as a mentor in the grandmother stage. It took me probably until I was 37 years old and had written The Baltimore Waltz, after my brother died, who was supposed to have been the writer in the family, that I actually said, well, I'm a writer. Someone in the family has to be a writer. Up until that point in time, I convinced myself, and I still do believe this, that playwriting is not actually being a writer in the sense that one writes a novel or a poem. I believe the playwrights create the script. The production is written by all the collaborators in the room, the actors, the director, the stage manager, but the individual play is actually written by the individual audience member. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that. But one of the things that I think was an important kind of through line, and still remains so, is that young women say, yes, I am a writer at a much, much earlier stage. Uh, and that young men do as well, that it's something that we own very early on and we don't suppress um, in elementary school or junior high or high school as we try to think what is a practical, pragmatic way to make a living that we're not censoring the artist in ourselves and that we recognize there are many, many different ways to be and remain and flourish as a playwright or as a writer. And that's a long answer. <laughs> Very eloquent. I had to back myself into the corner uh, and not have any other ways to escape before I could say I'm a playwright. Um, well, you spoke a little bit about Baltimore Waltz, which is actually the first play of yours I ever read. This beautiful, beautiful piece Jeremy spoke about as well. So many of your plays, I think of like, How I Learned to Drive, The Long Christmas Ride Home, you're drawing on personal material. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering, I know there are a lot of playwrights in the room here tonight. Um, how, do you, <laughs> how do you take this personal material and theatricalize it? What is your process like for taking you know, your own Right. and making, bring it to the stage. Right. Um, we actually didn't touch on this in the last uh, two days, but you know, I very much think of what are, the, what are the tricks and the tools of our trade that we all have? We have plot, we have character, we have language, we have music, we have spectacle. 
The one thing that's on the list of six elements in the poetics that I actually don't approach directly is the notion of thought or subject or theme. Uh, and the reason why is I believe we have to be subconscious as we're writing and not look directly into the sun or we become blind. So I had not meant to write Baltimore Waltz when I wrote it. I had meant to write Hot and Throbbing and I'd begun the first 10 or 20 pages of it. And my brother had died, I was his caretaker of HIV the year before. Now as I often say, if I thought that I was going to sit down and write a play about my brother dying, I would curl into a little ball and I would not be able to write a word. I had to take my brother's death and writing about it, put it in this hand and put it behind my back and not look at it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me as writers that if we concentrate, and I don't mean this at all, it's a profound way of playing games. If we can play games with each other in the room as collaborators, as audience and writers together, and not look directly at the thing, what did I think, have I not done? I hadn't traveled to Europe. When my brother asked me to go, I didn't know he was HIV positive. Never gone to Europe, don't speak any languages, and that became my game. To take a trip to Europe that I had never traveled to, and to speak all of these languages that I don't speak, and to construct a play about an imaginary Europe that I would travel with my brother. I knew where it was going, of course, but I try to forget that. Um, and the other thing that really helped me, I mean, the reason I ended up writing Baltimore Waltz is I went to this wonderful place, the McDowell Colony, <laughs> which um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about resources for all of us in terms of writing. Um, they took me in and they gave me this cabin, and when you go into the cabin, on the wall are the names of all the artists who've been in your cabin. And I looked at the wall, and there was Thornton Wilder. <laughs> and I went screw hot and throbbing, and I slammed the door. And two weeks later, I emerged with Baltimore Walls. <laughs> I actually feel that one of the things we have to do is sort of rush to the ending of what we're doing and not allow ourselves time to think about it. Thought in a funny way, the element of thought, as Aristotle would say, or thinking about what we're doing in many ways is the enemy of art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I do a lot of bake-offs with people. Write something in 48 hours. What comes out in 48 hours means we have no time to censor ourselves. We have no time to edit. We have no time to think. It's got to be raw. It's got to be whatever comes through. What's remarkable to me about Baltimore Waltz and How I Learned to Drive, which I wrote in a similar way, I went away into a, uh, a cabin in Alaska, and I emerged three weeks later with How I Learned to Drive. Those are the only two places where I actually have not changed a word. Mm -hmm. uh, everything else I've done drafts up, but not with those two places. And I think there was something about that, that rush of not letting myself, I would nap, I wouldn't sleep uh, for a night. I would, I would sleep for two or three hours, get up and go back. Um, but it's interesting, I'm hoping this is true. I have to say for those two plays, I felt a joy when I was writing it um, that was really a gift to me. Um, and it wasn't until I wrote Baltimore Waltz that I really realized that all, I, I never think that any of my plays will be produced, but thought if anyone ever produces Baltimore Waltz, they will use my brother's name in the present tense. Oh, that they'll be able to say, Carl is going to Europe. Oh. Um, and the recognition of what it is that theater gives us, of being life in the present tense, of being able to talk to our ancestors. Um, I often think of when we write a play, it's a way that to the people we've lost, who are in another dimension and in another world, that we put our play in a little scroll and put it into a bottle and toss it to the sea. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other, that play washes up on the shore 
where our loved ones are, are still alive in some way we can't feel. That to me is what we do every time we enter the theater. We're in the present moment of life and it reverberates out. And that notion of the present tense and the fact that Carl, I still, whenever people write me, it's, it's overwhelming to recognize that Carl's name is being said you know, in a community I've never visited. I always say to the artists who honor me, will you please say hello to my brother Carl? Mm -hmm. I can't see him. I'm not in that same dimension, but if you're performing this, you are. And I somehow or other believe he's in the back of the audience. Mm -hmm. Um, on many, many, many levels. Um, I was thinking a little bit about Indecent to remind me a bit of Indecent, even though that wasn't, you know, based on your family, as far as I know. Um, right. But there's something about that, too, that, I mean, the, the opening image with the people coming out, of the, the coming out of the dust and the going back to this other generation, um, it made me think a lot about that, too. Well, let, me, let me take a moment here, and I want to I, I wanna talk uh, very specifically to the writers, because it's very interesting, I think, in terms of where we are with the notion of autobiography and artistic work, which is to say that everything that comes out of us is autobiographical. Um, and oftentimes when people are saying, okay, so did you sleep with your uncle? Whatever, for the 1,000 <laughs> <laughs> is no way that one can create actual living or dead people on stage. It is created in equal part by the emotional generosity of the actor who imbues the character with their own very personal passion with the director and the designers and the writers. So I do want to say this. I am in a generation where I have fought about how much I talk about the actual autobiography in front of the press because women are labeled as confessional writers. Mm -hmm. I'll be damned if I'm going to be called a confessional writer until you call a Gene O'Neill confessional writer, Tennessee <laughs> Williams a confessional writer, until you call David Mamet a confessional writer. <laughs> no way of knowing. as emotionally truthful as we possibly can. I have to, because I'm trying to catch up with these actors that I've been blessed to work with, who go out in front of an audience of strangers and strip down to their naked souls night after night. I better come up to you know, match them at the plate. If they're doing that, I better put it out there. Anyone in the room who's in the room, the room is a sacred and safe place, I will tell anyone who does the honor of working on my work where it's coming from me. But the truth of the matter is, is that's only a layer. Where does it come from them? Where does it come from the individual member in the audience? I am saying this because I think one of the things that is very, very hard for people is when we actually want to invest our parents, our lovers, our spouses, our uncles, our aunts, our children, into our work. It feels like a trespassing of privacy. And I have to say that the, th 
this nice Jewish girl, I'm half Jewish, half, half Catholic. This is where I hold on to what my grandmother taught me about transubstantiation. <laughs> if you put something out there that is absolutely the naked truth about your own experience and life, everyone who sees the play will see their mother, their father, themselves. It transubstantiates into everyone's journey and not an individual journey. And I absolutely believe that. The more we tell our own truth, the more everyone can tell theirs. And it's a hard thing to believe. It was a very hard thing for me to believe as a younger writer. But I'm now at that point of believing in transubstantiation. I just want to say this. The good news is since we can't actually create real people, we can use the same real person in our lives for 20 different plays <laughs> and just show different facets. <laughs> you know, keep, keep recycling the same mother, the same grandmother for 20 different character recipes because, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, universality, that's just, and, and spirituality really right. depends on the work. Um, I want to go back a little bit to Indecent and uh, the uh, music that was in the piece. Right. Because you mentioned yesterday that, mu that you're thinking more about music these days, and music was such a key element in Indecent, for those of you who I know who are going to get to see this play, um, <laughs> it really serves as part of the structure of the piece. Right. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that, um, you know, that your process with Indecent, but also what you're really thinking about in terms of music in your work. Right. Um, maybe we should just take a second here and say Indecent is a play written about another play. There was a play that was written in 1906 by a young Yiddish writer, Sholem Ash, who was a young married man in his early 20s. It was his first play. And um, this first play went all across Europe with Yiddish theater troops, came to the United States, was a kind of sensation and critical success everywhere it went. And when it came to the United States, it played for many, many years, and someone got the bright idea, let's translate it from Yiddish and put it on Broadway in English. And, and whereupon the uh, opening night cast was arrested for obscenity. Um, in 1923, it launched a very infamous obscenity trial. Now, I read this when I was 24 years old. I read uh, an early translation. And I remember standing in the Cornell Library. I couldn't sit down. I couldn't stop turning the pages. And I started talking back to the play in my head. It was, the act two was the most beautiful love scene I have ever seen written between two women. So incredibly beautiful and pure. It really is Romeo and Juliet in the balcony scene. And I kept turning it, saying, a young man, a 24-year-old man <laughs> wrote this. <laughs> it slapped me around about my notions of, of identity. So when I got the chance six years ago, a very talented director who has loved this play since she was 23 or 24, and had actually tried as a graduate student when she was 27 to stage the obscenity trial, couldn't do it, kept the obsession 16 years later, approached and asked me, might we do this? I said, yes, but it's not the obscenity trial. And so for five years, I wrote Indecent. And by the way, I've gone through more than 40 drafts. <laughs> this has been an incredible, obsessional journey. When you say, is it, it's not autobiographical? Well, of course it is. Of course I've had family that, uh, Jewish family, uh, Russian and German, I have no idea what happened to family members. Um, I do know that a grandfather came from Heidelberg. I do know what happened to that particular Jewish uh, synagogue. But it's me as a teacher and a mentor in my 60s, recognizing all the amazing 20-year-old playwrights who come into my room or my classroom with an incendiary controversial play that they wrote out of sheer passion 
that I've said to them, you know, you're holding a bomb in your hands. And I'm going to produce your bomb, but we have to be ready for the explosion. And in the way that people, when they read my first play, said, you're sick. You're a sick woman. I've had a lot of people write to me with baby make seven, saying, put this away. You don't want to get this out there. So for me, I mean, look, whenever we're writing a play, we have to find our way into it. It has to be a very personal way into it. So it, it's a love letter for me to the younger playwrights whose work has been explosive, has been remarkable. Um, the late nights that we've spent in theaters having passionate conversations with audience members who are offended. And it's me as an older person kind of not wanting to do any harm to those young playwrights. So that's where it came from, from me. In terms of the music, my first love was musicals. I thought I was going to be a musical theater writer. Um, it's what I wanted to do. Uh, and in college, I thought, gee, I better learn something about, as we called it, the straight theater. <laughs> the theater that sleeps with theater of the opposite sex. <laughs> and I kind of got sidetracked, and I never got back. Um, I wrote uh, musicals in my, when I was 18, 19, 20, I wrote a musical of The Hunchback of Notre Dame called The Beautiful Quasimodo. I wrote uh, Lord of the Flies as Lady of the Maggots, about how <laughs> an all women's college, how civilization breaks down out of the, um, you know, things like that, and I got away from it. So, I, I have been writing more and more work with music. Civil War Christmas um, was really something that I wrote for the songs as a kind of book musical. Um, loved doing it. Um, and then when I got decent, I have about 300 klezmer songs, Yiddish songs, um, on my iPad, and I, I selected them and then wrote the book for them. So it turns out, it's a tiny little thing, this is kind of a, a plot spoiler, but this is an interesting thing for us to think about in our country in the 21st century, in this election, and what is the purpose of arts in our country? In 1943, in the ghettos, the Nazis decided that any Jews in the ghetto could not perform theater because they wanted to demoralize the prisoners and the inmates in the ghettos. So they took away what was most precious to the Jewish community. And the Jewish artists then could only perform cabaret and skits as a way to forget their daily lives. Now, isn't that extraordinary to think about? How do we take away our art as a way of losing our center as a community? Are we taking away our art, not in Minneapolis, perhaps, but I'm sure in Minneapolis it's still a struggle and a balancing act to make sure that the arts is accessible to every school children. So I think that that's kind of an interesting little side note. And for me, um, to take this beautiful love scene that I read when I was 23 years old and have it performed by this theater company in the ghetto, underground, as it were, on their night off, as an act of political defiance, as the last thing that they can perform as artists is really where it came from. Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about your mentorship and you, you know, talked about that before. Um, I think, I mean, it, it is such an art to be a good mentor. It is such a gift to be a good mentor. Um, and so many people have benefited from that. Um, I'm just wondering, have you had mentors in your life? And what do you think the, the qualities of a good mentor are? Uh, yes, I've had good mentors in my life. Not, not specifically as playwrights, but um, school teachers who came forward when I was at a very, very troubled time, um, who could notice in the class, <coughs> and who said, stay back and say, tell me what's going on. Or a couple of teachers who came forward and said, you know, your brother isn't the only writer in the family. Or, um, uh, a, a teacher when I was a freshman who 
saw uh, the beautiful Quasimodo and came running backstage and said, I think you need to take this seriously. I don't think it's that difficult to be a mentor. I am following their lead, which is our responsibility. I don't care what age people are when they, they listen to the artist in themselves, um, whether it's at age five or age 60 or age 80. I think we have a responsibility to point out when joy is on someone's face. To, to go back to the stage door when an undergraduate has just performed something and to say, do you realize your face is lit up, you're providing your own electricity and lighting up the stage. Are you feeling that joy? Pay attention to that joy. Please take it seriously. Are you aware how people around the room responded when you just wrote your first 10 minute play? Did you notice that? Maybe you were too stage frightened to notice that, but I did. Please pay attention to the bodies around you. They're telling you something. So that's basically the first step, right, is reflecting the joy that we're seeing and just telling other people there is joy. Please follow the joy. What can I do to help you follow the joy? So I did have people at significant points go, hey, you know what? Take that seriously. This is something, you know, I don't have no idea how you become a playwright, but you're doing something here. And, and that's a significant gift. The second thing, and this is why I'm saying it's really, it's really not a hard thing to be a mentor. I, uh, when I read a script, I notice when the hair goes up on the back with my arms and my neck. And I don't know how they did it. I don't know how the writer did it. I have no idea how the person who wrote the script is doing what they're doing. So I was very lucky. I formed this program for 24 years at Brown, and I managed to fundraise so that it was free tuition, and we gave a stipend uh, to all writers. It's still the case at Brown. And I basically would get in touch with writers and say, um, can you come to Brown and teach me? Here's the deal. When you come to Brown, you write your brains out, I will produce everything. And at the end of two or three years, I want to be able to articulate what you're doing. And if I can articulate it, every artistic director, every liter literary manager in the, in the country can articulate it. But you have to come and teach me. You have to come and basically be a peer brain trust um, to teach. So I actually think that's the other secret, right? Is if we're open to learning every day. And who wouldn't be when the tuition's free? <laughs> 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 that, that's kind of the right. secret to happening. And the third thing is a very important thing. And I do do what I call the FBI uh, uh, checklist before I ask a writer to join me or before I enter a room to work with people, I want to know that people are generous and kind. To me, it doesn't matter if you're a brilliant artist. Art is cheap. We're all artists, and it's cheap. Anyone who really has the hunger to become an artist can become an artist. But people are not renewable resources. If you are going to be unkind, you may be damaging someone's ability to sustain themselves as an artist. I don't want to be in the room. I don't want to see that damage or violence done. So it is a specific gift. Now, I think this is a remarkable field <coughs> filled with remarkable, generous people. And by the way, when I talk about being a theater artist, I am talking about patrons and audience members and board members and volunteers and everybody who's working to keep the theater doors open. That is a part of being a theater artist. So the generosity goes in many circles around an institution. If you are going to be unkind, I will be in the room once with you. Mm. I will not be in the room again. And I've kind of learned this, unfortunately, the hard way, mm -hmm. where I've slowed down my only impulse to want to, to create. Um, it is the only thing that we have, really. That's our own, that's our heart. Mm. It has to be A, protected, but it has to be able to be released and vulnerable in a room. And I've worked with so many remarkable artists who have given me remarkable trust and generosity and visibility. 
And that's the third thing, mm -hmm. is really, you know what? It doesn't mean that we're not gonna fight. Let's fight from love. Let's fight to make a better play. Let's fight with truth. Do not fight with negative ego, egotism. Ego is great, we need ego. Egotism, leave it at the door. And that's basically it. So it's not like, right, this isn't like rocket science. <laughs> this is just the way that we've been brought up, right, to be in a community. So, you know, I've been very, very lucky. I, I knew on the page the second I read all the writers I've worked with that they were doing something remarkable. No big, no big secret, and you know, that and making, I, the only other thing is I'm a Jewish mother. I like to feed people. Vaughn, <laughs> 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 um, well, you've been such a fantastic mentor to so many people, and we're seeing, I mean, so many of the writers that you've worked with and mentored are going off and, you know, creating this the next body of the American theater. Um, I'm curious to know, you, you talked a little bit about uh, um, in the 70s as a female writer, it was very, very hard. And, yeah. You know, and now we're seeing a, a many more female writers, not always produced, but as much as we might like, but um, a lot more writers writing really incredible plays. Right. Um, I'm wondering, over the past 20 years that you've been teaching, what have you seen in terms of trends of writing and what's in the zeitgeist right now? And yeah. where do you think we're headed? So okay, like three questions. Yeah, there are three questions. Um, I do want to give the statistics so people know. When I um, got my first play out um, as a 24-year-old, it was a play called Meg. And if you happen to have a copy, will you please, can I buy it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to grow the copies of that play. Anyway. <laughs> of all plays produced were by women. Five years ago, 17% of all plays mm -hmm. were produced by women. Yes. Um, yeah. This is got a long way to go. Right. Mm -hmm. However, now I want to tell you a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. And what do I see as the trend in terms of writers, writers of color, women writers, transgender writers? In the past five years, because of specific communities that have been built, I'm thinking of a group called the Kilroys, women writers, who have created a national database of brilliant plays that were not produced, written by women and transgender writers. They then send that list to every artistic director. Why? Because five years before, Artistic directors in Washington, D.C., including uh, a woman artistic director, said, well, of course we can't. We can't produce mm. women plays. They're not in the pipeline. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and that remark, perhaps, was the wrong remark to say. <laughs> <laughs> the Kilroys have started a pipeline. There's now a community called the Lilies in New York. If you are in New York, please go to the Lilies. It's one of the best gifts you can give yourself. It's basically the theater community coming together and celebrating women artists in New York, giving each other awards, but also creating scholarships and fellowships for emerging women writers. More and more women have been behind funding new initiatives, uh, fellowship scholarships. Now this may not seem like a lot, but bear in mind from 1974 to, oh, let's say 2000, we've gone from 16% to 17%. In the past five years, we've gone from 17% to 22%. And that, my friends, is collective action. Mm -hmm. So the initiative of 50-50 in 2020 uh, that so many women writers have, and women artists have, have banded together um, it, it might be achieved, who knows? Um, I think in a very similar way, listen, this, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm maybe the Bernie Sanders of women playwrights. <laughs> <laughs> and foundations and then 
National Endowment for the Arts, that institute must reflect the demographics of the community, period, period. I don't want to hear anything about special interest or blah, 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 blah. You know, we, we have no one in the pipeline. Oh, if only they were, were writing plays equal to. I mean, it's been going on too, too long. I don't know about you guys, I'm no longer watching uh, the Academy Awards after Selma. I have turned off the television, I'm sorry. Now, if in another five years, their voters are reflective of American uh, society, and so are the awards, I'll turn my television back on. It's a kind of um, collective community action and work that's happening, I think, with younger playwrights and directors and actors and producers. That if I were to say the trend right now, that's the trend. It's an incredibly important trend, that trend of activism. There is no theater without activism. Of all the things I'm glad that in my life I lived long enough to see, it is that. So you can just think in Minneapolis how many incredible companies have been rising up. I know Work uh, House is no longer with us, but I mean, just even when a theater company opens its doors, creates a new audience, and then goes on. Like, for example, Eye of the Storm um, mm -hmm. was a remarkable place for me to work. I will always be grateful to Casey Stengel mm -hmm. in helping me as a younger writer with that. Something has been changed in the air of the community. Um, and it's that that Minneapolis is doing. It's that the rest of the country has to do. But very particularly, it's that that New York and L.A. has to do. Mm -hmm. New York and L.A. have been intransigent. You cannot be, put your art on a pedestal in a museum mm -hmm. and do that kind of fundraising without opening the doors to the community. And I am hoping now that we're going to see within this decade the doors becoming open to our so-called museums of art. Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have the opportunity as well. So I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience at this point. Okay, sure. And over there. Sorry, uh, just, just at the- the lights up? Yeah, it's a little dark. Hi. Just at the, at the end of the last comments you were making, I leaned over to my partner here and I said, I wonder if Paula is familiar with Mixed Blood and the work that they've been doing. Yes. Okay, because radical hospitality, bringing in the community and it's- Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm very happy to say, wow, Jack Ruler. I yeah. mean, it's been <laughs> amazing, amazing work. Um, I mean, there's been this, like I said, there's been an incredible um, influence that Minneapolis theaters have had. Mixed Blood is a great example. Do people here remember Dominic Taylor? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Former, former writer that I've worked with. Um, <coughs> Uh, you, you know, I think that there are a lot of paradigms from here. Not, uh, talking about mixed blood, uh, talking about penumbra, talking about a different relationship between theaters in the community. Now, this may not be the case here. I don't live here. But what I am aware of in other cities is that there tends to be an institutional theater that is not collaborating with the other theater companies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not. <laughs> I, I, I'm from the East Coast, I'm from New England, so I'm, just, I'm talking personal experience here. Um, but in truth, radical hospitality is actually embracing all the companies and all the institutions, right? that live within the company. And it's amazing how theater or art galleries or art or music flourishes when you as an artist can go, okay, this is a mixed blood kind of play. I'd like to have it birthed here. Or this is workhouse. Or 
this is illusion or this is Guthrie, right? That, that it's really seen more as a kind of circle of institutions. That's the healthiest, healthiest, healthiest. And um, I have lived in a very small town of Providence that has small theaters, but I've also been very aware that you can knock on the door of our institutional theater and say, I brought you the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. And they go, oh, you have to get the one from the East before you're allowed to enter the doors. Mm -hmm. Under certain administrations, not always. So another part of this in terms of mixed blood or whatever, right, is how do you create that notion of sharing that breaks down individual institutions to a community-based sharing? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot because I know you're living here, but, but I'm, I'm seriously, I've, I've been working in a lot of towns where it feels like we're not being successful, which is kind of sad. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I think just finding ways to make it easier for those people. I mean, you can offer you can offer people free tickets to everything, but if they have kids at home and no way to deal with that, they're not, you know, or they can't bring their kids, or they, you know, there's so many different things about life or transportation and and right. getting people there and finding ways to do that and finding, yeah. I mean, there there was another theater in town. I can't remember if it was Pillsbury or not, but they were offering. They were offering childcare. They had a couple of volunteers who had a room set up with some toys, and parents could come and watch the show, and their kids went and played for you know a couple hours, and that helps. See, I love that. And by the way, I think what you're pointing to, particularly in terms of the notion of being an artist with children, of all of the shifts I've seen in my lifetime, that's a big one. Because quite frankly, you know, when I started being a playwright, I couldn't think of any women playwrights who were child raising. It was sort of, you know, become, become a nun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I think, uh, how many women writers have I worked with that are raising families? So the, the issue of child care is actually a very major one in terms of who is doing the parenting. I also think that it's been kind of interesting and thrilling to see how our notion of gender and parenting has changed. And this is all to, to the good. I do want to say that one something that is happening, which I really want to tell um, artists in the room, is that there are a number now of um, artistic colonies that are actually geared for artists with children, where they do exactly what you're talking about. Space at Ryder Farm, you bring your children with you. They have a camp set up for the children so that the parents can write. Uh, and create. Um, there's something called the Cromargo Foundation. I hope you don't mind me just spilling out the stuff but while it's in my brain. <laughs> yeah. Cromargo's 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 Cromargo. Foundation. Yes. Yeah. It also has a child care. Um, I believe it's Cromargo Foundation, right? Uh, the apartment uh, yeah. for that. Do we know of other resources in the room right now for people with families that? And it's not just families, by the way, it's also people who are caring uh, for aging parents. This is the other end of the spectrum of how do we help people who are taking care of their parents have time free, people who are caretakers right now. How do we start creating programs as the community? And if a community can share that outside a specific theater company, right, then everybody wins. Everybody wants. I love hearing about that. Is there anything else as a paradigm that's going on here that kind of helps the participation? I think project success, mm -hmm. uh, if other people are familiar with that. My son is, he's going to be a senior in high school, but he's been involved with project success since middle school. They offer free tickets um, to multiple shows, theater and dance and music, to any kid. Any, any kid of right. any grade, and you can get up to four tickets. You can bring parents with you. you can, it's an amazing, amazing program. So that's good. I, I know that the Wilma Theater has just uh, endowed their tickets. Tickets cost $25, and that's it, um, and is free for students, et cetera, and so forth. 
Um, so a number of theater companies, I think, right now are being more successful with foundations. Quite frankly, I really do think theater should be free. Um, I actually think that this is something that should be in, underwritten in our budgets. I know that that's kind of a long reach right now. Because, um, <laughs> individual uh, uh, payment um, for health care, and um, we'd like to also expand Social Security. Ah, on my on my list. Is so, but I love hearing about these tangible things that are happening here because this is information that I can kind of bring back. And I can say, well, in Minneapolis. <laughs> um, you in passing mentioned the theater in the ghetto. And um, that's a really interesting topic for me, connecting you know, the more intellectual pursuits we have with uh, helping our community, in particular teenagers in shelters. And yes. Theater can be used um, yes. therapeutically for yes. them. Um, how members of our community can go to teach and, and have um, the, the team members of the shelters produce their own plays, yes. perhaps, and show the plays. Yes. And I wanted to know in your experience if anything like that has been done. Um, well, when my brother died, I had asked for a leave. It was my only leave of absence from teaching for a semester, but he died before I, I got the leave, but he died before I could uh, take advantage of it. So I spent the semester setting up a theater program for women of maximum security in Cranston, Rhode Island, which has now been taken over by the Brown University uh, Women's Center. Um, so I spent uh, uh, six months you know, working with the inmates and then brought in the graduate writers. And um, uh, I thought the work was remarkable. Um, and right now, one of my passions, um, I, I spent three years working uh, at the Wilma uh, with veterans, um, and I, it's something that I am now very passionate about. There is a project, can I just tell you about this? If you want to find it, you can probably find it. Um, I actually, I can't, I fudged my, um, my resume to try and get a job when I was 27 years old. <laughs> because there was a theater company in New Jersey called The Whole Theater that was set that was founded by three artists who decided they would share artistic director. It was um, Apollo Dukakis, Olympia Dukakis, and her husband, Louis. Louis Orange. And they decided that they wanted to stop starving in New York, they wanted to go into the suburbs, they wanted to have a family, and they wanted to give back to the community. And that they had this vision that they would be able to go to the high school football games. And the same way you'd say, oh, there's the, our, our postmaster, or there's our, right? They'd say, oh, here comes the, the whole theater company. And what they did was they started an after school program for first time juvenile offenders. And they would, anyone who went in front of a juvenile court judge had to choose six months at a reformatory or six months at the whole theater company. <laughs> <laughs> and these young high school, middle school students were trained in the run crew, given acting lessons by the apprentice program. I saw the statistics. This is why I fudged my resume. I, Finally got an interview with Olympia who looked at the resume and said, You're fudging this, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am, but I really <coughs> so you will, but no. <laughs> I read their their data. The program costs three million dollars a year. The number of lives that were saved, the rate of recidivism crashed, the high school attendance soared, the grade point average soared for ten years. The whole theater company saved lives. These were young people who wrote plays. I mean, they participated in all of the theatrical processes. And this isn't to say, I actually, uh, it, I feel nostalgic now. A Republican governor was elected who decided she had to cut the budget somewhere. And there went the whole theater after school program. Hi, Christine Todd Whitman, wherever you are. <laughs> And at that point, the whole theater company went, well, if we're not giving back to the community, why, why are we existing? And Olympia took 
uh, screen role, what was that, Moonstruck. <laughs> and that was the end. People don't know this about Olympia Dukakis, but she's, she's a hero. She's actually a hero. Isn't it interesting? We might think about her as a screen actress, but she's a community hero. So in terms of what you're saying, it would, it's so wonderful to have a synergy for, for mentorship that is perhaps just a few years older. Like one of the things that I think was really kind of wonderful when I started the program at Brown was to have playwrights who were, you know, end of their 20s, really mentoring 20-year-olds, but then to have the 20-year-olds mentoring the high school students, right? So that you create that kind of chain where people can see a role model almost within reach. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things, excuse me, Dramatist Guild, can't we call this traveling mistresses program? Because <laughs> <laughs> I always worry about it. It is so much more dynamic, I think, for people to be in a conversation with someone that's really almost in the generation. And this is where I think in terms of the modeling of programs that you're talking about is so extraordinary that it creates a synergy. Many, many, many programs. I'm actually very interested in any programs that are, that are in this community. Um, I'm continuing to work with veterans. I very much want as a kind of homage to Olympia Dukakis and the job I never got. Um, this is on my list in the next decade. I'd like to start working with a juvenile population in terms of um, first-time juvenile offenders. I tried working with women in shelters, but I do recognize that that is at times a protective isolation that I can appreciate. But can you tell me a little bit more in terms of, of, of kids in the shelter and what you're thinking in terms of this? Well, I'm, I'm thinking of this in terms of after-school programs and um, the collaboration between established theaters and teachers Great. volunteering right. um, for the students. Great. And as, as a form of a psychotherapy as well. Yes. Right. Um, just, I don't know if you know this, uh, but folks, this is sort of my, how I made my, my, my dream life of projects. Um, I don't do it very often, but I have to start doing it again. There is something called the Foundation Center, and I believe it has a physical library in Minneapolis, does it not? Yes. Or no? Chicago. Chicago is the closest. That's all right. Foundation Center, if you happen to be near Chicago, there are six physical libraries in the United States. One is in New York. You basically look it up, you go to the building, you go into the library and you literally say, like this is what I did, I walked in and I said, hi, um, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm trying to find money to support young playwrights for going into women's prisons and maximum security in Rhode Island. And they went, Let's, let, let me help you. And they do what's known as a data spin search for you and out spits list of corporations and foundations. Did you know that the Le Revlon Corporation actually is interested and has mm -hmm. money, I don't know if they still do, but they did then, for programs that impact women? <laughs> so, if you can get physically to the Foundation Center, that would be great. But secondly, if you can't, um, you should be able to find a subscription to the Foundation Center here in one of the libraries. Does anyone in the audience happen to have a subscription to the Foundation Center? You can just do it from a computer. No? Oh, someone over here, huh? <laughs> it's like $20 for a month. $20 for a month. Also, in terms of here, just going and saying, may I meet the director of marketing, may I meet the, the person who's doing development in the theater company. Um, I, you listen, I have to say this, there is, there is a fifth rule, I think, about being in theater, which is have no shame. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know what I mean? Just, and some people will say no, and they won't ever answer the calls, but other people will say, okay, I have 10 minutes, go in. And if you walk in and say, if I can find the money, if you agree to be the umbrella organization and I do the footwork and I find the grant, is this something that you'd be interested in sponsoring? I realize how busy you are. 
But it's remarkable how often, again, like I said, this is a generous community. I think what you're talking about as an after-school program for children in shelters would have an enormous impact. There's a local resource, too, um, called the Arts and Culture Funders Database. What is it? The Arts and Culture Funders Database. So you can kind of, uh, kind of plug in uh, your project idea or your organization. And you can, you can reach that for free through MRAC. Mm -hmm. okay. And try talking to Noel Raymond over at Pillsbury House because Pillsbury House also has an annual program called the Chicago Avenue Project mm -hmm. where they work with kids from the schools and they bring in um, professionals and the kids write the shows, they perform the shows, the professionals are there to help them, they direct, they do, yeah, and they do this every year. So they're, they're already doing a lot of things to reach out in the community. I, I gotta tell you, I feel like, I'm in the candy store every time I go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, that's fantastic. So if you just look for each other, you can probably, these, these are great. Other resources in terms of this? There's one over there, we've got a question. Yep. Sorry. No? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> uh, I was going to say the Capri Theater North Minneapolis uh, is an alternative school. It runs uh, programming uh, for, for its kids. Mm -hmm. But while I have you, Lovely. Uh, I very much enjoyed your comments about the process. But I'm just curious, to what extent are you a critic? Can you, as a writer, go to play and not be a critic? Or, or are you, I'm just curious when you see something, and you ever get the sense, oh, I wish I had written that? Hmm. Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> primarily with the writers I work with. I mean, primarily, I wish I'd written. Um, the work of, of writers I work with. Um, you know, it's interesting. It depends on what you mean by criticism. Uh, I, uh, I'll just give you uh, an anecdote. Uh, I've only done it once. I tried to do it in New York and um, failed. I still am going to try. <laughs> I actually did a boot camp with 36 critics and reviewers <laughs> and cultural writers in Washington, D.C., um, which was absolutely thrilling. Um, and I said, nothing goes beyond this room. You will not critique each other's work. You will not uh, talk about each other's work. Will you please write? And I threw out the usual exercises, which I love to do, which is, for example, write a short play that is impossible to stage. <laughs> um, another one that I find I return to again and again is write a short play with a dog as protagonist. And I have to tell you, the dog plays running around, barking around um, the country are remarkable. So I asked the critics to do that. And one of the things that was a gift for me coming out of the room is to recognize how much these 36 people loved theater and what an incredible collection of knowledge they had of, right, of, of dramatic literature. And their writing was really, really good. Um, one of the critics actually left the newspaper and started coming up and setting in on the workshop at Brown University. So it depends on what we think of criticism. If we're thinking of criticism as the thumbs up, thumbs down, gladiatorial, this lives, this dies, then no, I am never a critic. But if we talk about going into a work of art and, and saying what in this work of art has changed me, has an impact, makes me rethink theater differently, is a moment that I love, and what for me isn't working and why, then yes, I'm a critic every time I enter, as are we all, right? The difficulty right now is we're not, been, we haven't been given enough space. We are eliminating response and criticism from our newspapers. God bless newspapers. I'm happy to say that blogs are replacing it, but it's something that is vitally important. Interestingly enough, one of a uh, wonderful playwright. Carolyn McGraw is now trying to do something as an initiative that I tried unsuccessfully 15 years ago, 
which is she's trying to get playwrights to write about each other's work mm -hmm. oh. on an online theater blog. And I think, do you have anything like that here? You do? Yes. It's <laughs> Minneapolis, of course you do. It's largely rooted in the dance community here, but that's also the experimental theater community here. Um, it's called Criticism Exchange. It's <coughs> a blog where artists are writing about each other's work. It's fantastic. Exchanging pieces for each other. It's fantastic. You know, I feel very um, nostalgic to recognize that there was a time where artists and critics knew each other, mingled at the same cocktail parties, got into arguments. I actually started weeping the first time I ever went, went to the Monte Carlo uh, cottage that belonged to O'Neill's family. And I went upstairs, and there was a big trunk that Brooks Atkinson, the critic, gave to the O'Neills for their honeymoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of grabbed my heart and I thought, what have we lost? Mm -hmm. um, and why are we not thinking of critics as theater artists that belong to the community? They are part of the mm -hmm. community. So it, again, like I said, if it depends on what you mean by criticism, I think we are all critics within the theater community. I think the unfortunate thing has been to pretend that there's an objectivity. How could we possibly be objective? But rather, if we can expose our subjectivity while giving our responses, I think it's a great thing. Yes, sir. Um, you made the transition into education. So I'm in that world of being in the real, excuse me, the real world of making theater, and then all of a sudden in academia. What suggestions do we really, can we really make with those artists that are students of ours who want to do this other thing? And they are so, especially now, advised not to because it doesn't make economic sense, as well as personal family. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I have a really good, uh, I have a down pat. <laughs> <laughs> I have a discussion of, do you want me to talk to your <laughs> um, I am happy to talk to your parents because I have to tell you, I mean, at, uh, early on, um, there was a young Filipino artist who had joy on her face being in theater. And I said, take this seriously. And then she dropped out of sight. And when I saw her maybe a year later, I thought there was something I had done. And she said, my parents have asked me not to talk to you or anyone in the theater. I'm a pre-med student. And it was devastating to watch that. A couple of things that I do want to say, which is, uh, I think it was George Bernard Shaw who once said, you know, he went out to Hollywood and all of the movie mo models were talking to him about his art. And he said, I'm a writer, I want to talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> Right? How do we do that? And um, I would have stopped mentoring writers a long time ago if I didn't know where they, they are and where they're going to be. That they're having families, that they have nice apartments or houses, that their children are going to school, that they can afford it. Are they making as much as a hedge fund manager? No. Are they making as much as a labor lawyer, uh, a public defender, a school teacher, yes, right? And the truth of the matter is that there are, are ways for us, if we are smart enough to be theater artists, we are smart enough to put the pieces together. And there are many ways to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things right now is episodic TV and narrative writing. Mm -hmm. It's one way. Secondly is teaching, right? Third is for actors doing voiceovers, reading books on tape, et cetera, and so forth. I mean, we have a skill set in this field. It's actually extremely marketable, but we have kind of been drinking the Kool-Aid and believing that what we're doing doesn't pay, and that's not true. So I kind of, you know, get in the door there with someone, say, take it seriously. Okay, now let's talk about how do you make it. How do you make a living up from it? I am interested in us making a living. Um, 
a lot of this has to do with, in academia, a lot of fights because it's as if, I have to say this, I feel that in a, a lot of faculty meetings I've been treated in a way, as I call it, the whore of Babylon. Mm. Because I want to talk about how do you do a cover letter, where do you send it, how do you get an agent, how do you talk to a literary manager, how do you figure out the marketing of your work, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not rocket science, but the notion of academia as being something pure we don't want to talk about, how do they do it? it just perplexes me. And I'm not saying this is true about all institutions, maybe it's just the ones that I've been spending the last century, half century of my life. And this is the, you know, have no shame, which is if there's something that we don't know, this is kind of a great thing. Um, I can't say how delighted people are in the field or in the trade as agents or as publishers uh, or as directors of marketing to come up. This may sound crazy, but I've just been thinking about this. It would be wonderful to get together groups of playwrights with graphic artists who train us in graphic arts so we know how to express what our play worlds are doing on the posters, on the images, on the web, right? Yeah. And it's actually an incredibly creative field on this. I don't know if this is kind of answering it, but you probably have so many resources around you. I'm in Twin Cities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're in Minneapolis. <laughs> I mean, just think about how, and you're teaching, right? Yeah. Think about how connected your students are. One of them is right over there. <laughs> Take this seriously, man. That's fantastic. Right? Yeah. Um, obviously, one of the most kind of strange ways of starting is to say, we're artists and we've been doing this for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. We're in this. We're living. And I don't, I'm, I've always thought, if I could figure this out, <laughs> everybody can figure this out. But do you know what I mean? It's, it's being able to impart exactly the strategies that you've used and, and pass that on. Um, so they're, they're very lucky to have you as a mentor. They're very lucky that they're in this particular city and town to do this. Um, one other thing that I always think about, and it's just, I still think it's true, I tell um, artists that I'm working with that the way that I like to think of it is finding a kind of home in every port. And it's not finding a Guthrie necessarily in every port, it may be finding What's the smallest theater company here? <laughs> a lot of them. Okay, give me the name of a 50-seat theater here. Dreamland Arts. Yeah. Dreamland Arts. It's finding a Dreamland Art in every city. If you can find a Dreamland Art where you can either act or direct or write or design, right? And you think, okay, what is Dreamland Art in San Francisco? What is it in Portland? What is it? Find the work that you love and find out what Dreamland Art is doing that. And they'll usually be 50 seat to 90 seat right. theaters. That's where you knock on the door, that's where you get your job. And it actually grows. You become a national artist by figuring out Houston, Atlanta, right? DC, Kansas City. Unicorn, right? So I'm sure everything that you've been doing, <laughs> right, in your life, it's so lucky that you can kind of say that's what's working. And even if I feel very often that my generation may, it may not be true, the truth of the matter is it's even better, I think, for younger generations because there are more dreamland arts than there were when I was the starving playwright, right? It's a different kind of access that they have. Yeah, talk about that a little. Well, Different the access. Well, the access is because the media works. They, they, they. Yes. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they understand the networking and the connections in a different way. That's I mean, right. We, I could not, I had to have my student tell me how to do a Facebook event. <laughs> right. Right. To right. create that. So they, there's an understanding of how to get your work out there. Yes. But it's also getting them to make sure, I shouldn't say make sure, but to encourage them to make their work better. 
And right. that's, I guess, one of the concerns that happens. It can kind of shortcut it because it is one of like promote it, but it's not done yet. Well, but you know, I, I'm going to just be a, a, a little contrary on this. Um, in that when I started the program at Brown, what I wanted was to start a process where writers could put up their first draft oh. and not work on it. And that we said to the audience, this is a first draft. And we're not working on it. And they had two weeks to put it up. <laughs> and this is what a workshop is. This is not a production. Mm -hmm. And from your responses and your conversation, we do the next draft. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that we get better is actually. Yeah, like actors do. Yeah. Doing it. I mean, right? How do actors get up and in a week's time do that? And Harry's an actor, too, so hey. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, aren't you always, but seriously, aren't you always going up and, and with incredible... Fear. <laughs> Fear works. Fear works for me. So I do want to say that in my heart, I worry that we have become more product-oriented mm -hmm. and less process-oriented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to say it's addictive and infectious just let everybody in on our process. It's still terrifying. It's terrifying. It's <laughs> this product. Might as well say to everybody, yeah, I'm terrified. This has never been in front of an audience before. I, this is the first draft I wrote two weeks ago. Thank you for coming. You're part of the process. Yeah, it's going to make it better. You know what I mean? So, anyway, fantastic. Just one more question. Oh, no. Yeah. You were just finished talking about process. Yeah. How has your process changed over the years? Do you, are things more important? You just said, name the two plays you said you did in three weeks again. Uh, it was the Baltimore Waltz and Howard Ridge Drive. And you said those are both three weeks, and then there's all those plays in between. Right. And what was the time span between those two plays? Oh, 1992 to 1997. Okay. So. Right. All the good works behind me. What can I say? <laughs> Don't believe it. My, but my process is just now taken a huge learning curve in that I have finally worked with a director for five years of our lives extremely closely, page by page, with me reading books and books and books and going into the room and Sundance and having different casts and ripping and pulling out different songs and having composers and a choreographer. I've never had this in my lifetime. If you told me that I was going to write more than 40 drafts and stay with something for five years of my life, I would have said, <laughs> no, I never finish anything like that. I never really finish anything. So I'm trying to figure out what I've learned from this. And I think that what I've learned from it is that I have to be in the room with people more obsessed and passionate in a way than I am. And one of the things that's really a blessing right now, and it's kind of strange for me, is that I walk into the room and I recognize I'm the oldest person in the room. Oh, no, that's a huge, right? Adjustment oh, for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you just want like this to be. <laughs> is kind of a really wonderful thing, which is I'm like, I'll be damned if I'm the first one that collapses. I'm going to be burning the midnight you know, lamp longer. I'm going to be up early. I'm going to write my director at 5 a.m. <laughs> and so I'm realizing that this is really kind of a very positive thing in my process. But I'm not sure yet, except that I've been just given a gift with the last five years. And um, I, I still think that um, I'm now choosing work to do because I want the process rather than the work itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very much.